getting recording. Um, I will, as I mentioned, um, to make up for last Monday when we didn't meet and maybe for this coming Monday when we're not going to be able to meet, uh, I will put, I will, you know, cut down the uh, lectures so they're a little bit more palatable for you to kind of view online and I'll get them up uh, into the course environment and let you know about it and have a um, couple of little uh, assignment activities to uh, uh, focus your, your viewing of the online lectures. But uh, for today, I really just want to give you kind of an overview for thinking about uh, how our thoughts of Mars have changed and the, our place in the universe overall uh, over this period from about 1550 to today. Okay. So, you know, realistically, we've had this huge shift in our thoughts about the, our place in the universe, our overall worldview. Uh, it's been um, an amazing journey that humans have gone on intellectually and conceptually. Uh, going back from, you know, the previous view of this distinct separation between what is going on up in the heavens versus what's going on on earth with the heavens being this unknowable realm that have these points of light in the sky that are moving around, um, as opposed to this you know, imperfect view of what we have going on on the Earth, to the point now where you know, we're thinking of Mars in particular, the subject of this course, as this new world that we can explore, remotely at this point, but uh, ideally within hopefully my lifetime and certainly your lifetime, uh, you know, this would be a place, a world that we could actually physically explore in person. So there were three or four major components to that shifting worldview. Uh, I just want to lay out for you to help you think about the materials that uh, are covered in the those assigned readings that uh, we've had so far for the for the term. Okay, th this one we actually talked about a week ago, although we didn't quite finish it up, and I'll put more of this online, but obviously the first and most fundamental change here was the Copernican Revolution. This was critical for breaking down this barrier, this distinction between what is going on on Earth versus what is going on on the heavens. The Earth just becomes part of a much larger um, universe, and uh, that in turn makes all of these planets that were kind of unknowable lights in the sky, turns them into other worlds that we can apply our experience on Earth to understand. Um, as we talked about, I mean, both of these concepts did an adequate job of explaining various observations, like how the planets and stars and the sun and the moon moved in the night sky and the day, daytime sky. Uh, but, um, you know, in terms of evaluating predictions like uh, the phases of Venus, which I'll put more online about, uh, over time it was really accepted that this heliocentric view of the universe um, is a better representation of what's going on, even though our day-to-day -day observations and our senses make us think that the Earth might be this unmoving center of the universe. Uh, really, the conceptual advances, the you know, examining the predictions, um, allows us to kind of break out of being controlled by what we just see in our day-to-day -day observations to come up with this uh, uh, larger idea of uh, you know, the Earth being just one of many worlds that goes around the Sun, which in turn is just part of this larger Milky Way galaxy. Now, clearly you all grow up in our modern culture with uh, an understanding of a heliocentric view of the solar system and the universe. So it's second nature to you. But 
if you, you know, kind of really put yourself in the mindset of someone 600 years ago who was growing up in that geocentric model, hopefully you can get an idea of just what a fundamental shift this was. And I'll get off my soapbox, but, you know, just think about that. So, um, well, let me, let me just, uh, who were some of the major names, the major players involved in the Copernican Revolution? I won't bother going back on the slide, but uh, who, would have, who would we have been talking about? Tycho Brahe played a role in terms of having the observations that triggered a lot of the investigations. Kepler. Kepler. And uh, definitely put a lot more information about Kepler and his laws of planetary motion. Um, so Kepler was important. Herschel. Herschel, not so much. Herschel we'll talk about on this slide. Okay. But in terms of the Copernican Revolution, well, nobody said Copernicus. So obviously Copernicus, Kepler, uh, what role did Galileo play? Phases. Phases of Venus. Again, you know, providing some of the new kinds of observations that tipped the balance toward the heliocentric view. So that was maybe 1550 to the early 1600s, you know, um, late in the Middle Ages, clearly before the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and so forth, it was really this shift that sort of laid, led the uh, groundwork for the later period of Enlightenment and Renaissance and all of the changes in society and culture and so forth that occurred in Europe afterwards. Uh, with the geocentric model, um, Part and parcel of that was the idea that not only was the earth fixed in place, but so really were kind of societies and individuals. And, you know, if I were born back in the uh, 1400s, I would have been a poor peasant like my forebearers. And this idea of progression and all of that stuff that came later really was triggered to some extent by the revolution in worldview that the Copernican Revolution um, um, brought about. So the next phase is kind of understanding, well, if Mars is a world like the Earth is a world, what can we say about it? And so this is, again, the early period of uh, telescopic observations. You have crude drawings of light and dark structures on the surface of Mars as seen by the uh, observers. Um, these patterns of light and dark markings are basically differences in albedo, the lightness or darkness of the different part of the planet. And that's basically what, what observers had for the period from Oh, the early 1600s through about the middle 1700s, late 1700s. What were the actual, what were the important aspects of Mars as a planet that were actually discovered during this time? Okay, so we have polar caps. Where else are we familiar with polar caps? On the Earth. Okay, so we're seeing something on Mars that reminds us of something we're familiar with here on the Earth. Uh, what are some of the other important observations during this time? Um, the Hourglass Sea. Okay, the Sirtis Major, the Hourglass Sea here. By tracking the position of features like the Hourglass Sea, early observers were able to tell what about Mars? It's spinning, okay, and about uh, and the spinning of Mars obviously is the same, similar to the spinning of the Earth. It causes our day and night cycles, and what was uh, discovered very early about Mars in terms of its day length. About the same as ours. About the same as ours, okay. So, yeah, about twenty-four hour day. 
give or take, give a little bit, uh, a little bit longer than 24 hours. Uh, we've got polar caps. We have, we can tell by looking at these features on Mars that Mars is tilted on its axis, similar to what uh, the Earth is tilted on its axis, uh, which would lead to what happening on Mars? Seasons. Seasons, okay. So there's this period in the mid-1600s and early 1700s where people are doing their best to observe what they can see on Mars, and Mars is looking very, very much like the Earth. Similar day length, there are polar caps, those polar caps change, they grow um, during what would be the colder seasons, they, they shrink during what would be the warmer seasons, so we're talking about winters and summers on the northern and southern hemisphere of Mars, we're talking about a day length that's very similar. Get this idea, uh, a very important idea is put forward during this time period of plurality of worlds, that... Um, you know, we know Earth as a world that is full of life and humans and intelligent life. Uh, if all of these things that used to be points of light in the sky are now worlds, many of them may also be very hospitable worlds. Uh, of this plurality of worlds idea is there may be hundreds and thousands of worlds throughout the universe that are Earth-like and can, you know, support life the way we do. So people were, were talking about inhabitants of the Moon, inhabitants of Mars, inhabitants of Jupiter, which we now know is kind of silly. Uh, but, you know, it was this idea that, you know, before the Copernican Revolution, we had humans on Earth, and we had this realm of perfection up in the heavens, and now all of a sudden we have this explosion of potential worlds that may have their own peoples on them, you know, that's got to be quite a, quite a kick in the head to the, you know, view of, of people. So, um, let's see, somebody mentioned Herschel? Yeah. So Herschel was talking about this uh, seasonality and because he was really the one who really focused on that axial tilt and, and the seasons. Uh, and talking about the Martians, the inhabitants of Mars, experiencing a situation very much similar to our own. So, you know, clearly Herschel is an important name here. What other yeah, names? There's a lot of discussion about what those polar caps could be. Oh, he was the first guy to say that. Uh, yeah, I. Yeah, the, Herschel was not the first person to discover the polar caps, no. but he was the one who really made the argument most thoroughly about uh, that they would be ice. Okay. So, again, this is another example of um, that use of analogy. We know something about the Earth. We have polar caps on the Earth. They're made of ice. They... You melt away during the summer, they get larger in the winter, we see similar kinds of behavior on Mars, so we can make an analogy that, well, maybe we can say that there, there are polar caps of ice on Mars. And indeed there are, but they're not quite the same as the polar caps on the Earth. So Herschel, Huygens, Cassini, you know, these would be many of the names that would be involved in this stage. Um. So then things kind of settle down. Um, there's not the, we've kind of made all the fundamental changes. Uh, we've broken down the barrier between Earth and heavens. We think of Mars as another world. If Mars is another world, then well, what have we done with our world? We've mapped it. You know, we spent a lot of time mapping where the continents are, where the cities are, where people live, and so forth. So that period of understanding what Mars is like as a world was followed by this period of, well, let's get an, a handle on what is going on on Mars by doing what we can do, which is to map it. So uh, you get this period primarily in the 1800s. 
maybe late 1700s through the um, late 1800s, where every time Mars comes around uh, in its closest period uh, location on to Earth during opposition, telescopes are trained on Mars to look at those patterns of light and darkness and to try to map out um, you know, the physical features and any kind of uh, artificial features that might be seen on Mars. Um, this is more kind of just refining our view of Mars. There's not any fundamental change in conception of the world that's involved here. It's more a matter of uh, getting more and more accurate observations and collecting those observations into maps uh, that tie all of them together. Now, what allowed people in the 1800s to map Mars in this detail compared to the crude sketches that were taking place in the 1600s and 1700s? People were smarter in the 1800s? Was it that, uh, the telescope, the fusion with the Cassini? Okay, so telescope and the development of telescopes is really what drove the advances in Mars exploration during this time period. And that is, you know, that's a fairly fundamental thing you should, re you should realize about science. Oftentimes, the technology that we have will determine what kinds of observations we can make and what kinds of explorations we can make. I mean, before we had the telescope, Mars was never anything more than just a bright point of light in the sky. As telescopes developed and got better and better, we got better and better views of Mars, and so people could think about mapping Mars in the 1800s based on the advances in telescopes that they had compared to, I mean, this would have been impossible in the... 1500s because, or even the 1600s, because telescopes were not good enough to show any kind of detail on the surface of Mars. We are still doing that today. The reason why we, much of the reason why we understand Mars better today is that we can develop and send to Mars even better instruments that allow us to measure things uh, that we can't even detect from our senses. So, you know, microscopic imagers, um, spectrometers that are uh, measuring different wavelengths of light, visible, invisible, uh, x-ray uh, detectors, things that allow us to ask questions about the world in ways that we can't, just relying on our um, our unaided senses. Uh, any any names that uh, you want to throw out for this period of time? The main areographers, the the people who mapped Mars during the eighteen hundreds. Beer and, Beer and uh, Madler, Madler, yeah. um, Madler being the money in the in the operation and beer being the actual observer. Um, Chiaparelli. Chiaparelli is uh, probably the most important name in this time period. There are others, Dawes, Proctor, um, Asap Hall, uh, who worked in the Naval Observatory, also did some mapping of Mars but was responsible for discovering the moons of Mars. But uh, Chiaparelli in particular uh, was one of the most influential mappers um, and you know, worked toward the latter half of the 1800s into the uh, early 1900s uh, and developed some of the most detailed um, maps of Mars. Uh, there were other investigators who focused more on you know, Chaparelli was colorblind, and so he was very much focused on 
uh, making very refined measurements of where light and dark uh, structures were seen on Mars. And so the accuracy of his mappings were probably greater than anyone who was working, else who was working at the time. Uh, but because he's colorblind, he couldn't, you know, look at some of the other features like, you know, very subtle gradations in color. So uh, the maps really kind of vary in some of these properties uh, that you see developing during this time. Uh, Chiaparelli. was also very critical in describing this, these structures on his maps of Mars call, that he called canali in Italian, which means channels. But uh, what does canali sound like in English? Canals. Canals. And, um, you know, it's this work that Percival Lowell really drew on to... Uh, to drive his exploration of Mars. He's born in a wealthy family in Boston. Um, let me skip through some of this. His um, key contributions were in a couple of areas. Uh, he set up his own observatory out in Flagstaff, Arizona, as opposed to putting up an observatory in Boston. Why would you go out to Flagstaff if you're a better view. Okay, the desert air, um, less cloud, less humidity in the air. Um, you have a greater chance of having less turbulent air at night when you're trying to observe. And so um, observations during the telescopic period of exploration, not only limited by the quality of the instruments that people had, but also the quality of the seeing, the the conditions that people had to look through. Um, so, you know, Connecticut, not the best place to set up an observatory, even if you've got a very high, you know, nice telescope, because, um, you know, the atmospheric conditions just are not as, as good. Today, uh, most of the ground-based telescopes, the really important ones, are at very high altitudes. They're up on the mountains in Chile or in Hawaii or other locations uh, where you get desert air. And the higher you get, the higher the altitude that you have for your telescope, the less of the Earth's atmosphere you have to look through. And so you get much better uh, quality of observations. That's why the, the, um, there are many uh, important uh, research telescopes down in, in Chile, up in the mountains, in the Andes Mountains, uh, and then um, uh, a lot of telescopes in uh, uh, high altitudes in Hawaii. Okay, so part of his uh, um, contribution was the idea of, uh, you know, setting up a facility where really high quality observations could be made. He also was very important in popularizing the exploration of Mars. He was sort of the Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson of his time. You know, he did a lot of public lectures. He did a, a, a lot of popular writing in uh, weekly magazines and so forth and uh, put all of his arguments together in three major texts. Mars, Mars and its canals, and Mars as the abode of life. These all came out in the early 1900s. And uh, Mars as the abode of life is what uh, I want us to focus on, on today. I just wanted to put up the foreword to Mars as the abode of life. Because this really lays out what Lowell was attempting to do in this text. This is essentially a text-length argument that he's making from first principles to the end, and that's what we want to look at today. Um, but, you know, he's talking about astronomy in the past had been focused on kind of predicting positions of stars and planets and understanding what were the mechanisms that led to, you know, Mars moving across the sky and so forth. But over time... Uh, astronomers became more interested in these planets as worlds. 
So he talks about, uh, you know, that uh, the gravitational astronomy is talking about how planets move in relationship to, you know, the gravity of the sun and, and things like that. What Lowell is trying to do in his arguments is to essentially develop a new field of science that he calls planetology, which is essentially how do you understand the origin and development of planets the stages they go through, what their eventual fate is. So he's attempting, um, you know, before Lowell there was all of this work on astronomy, and also before Lowell there was all of this work by Darwin and others that were describing the patterns and processes that controlled the evolution of life. And so what Lowell is trying to do is join those two great those two large areas together by describing how planets develop out of the astronomical conditions that they arise in, how they develop over time, and how the development of planets in turn influences the development of life. Okay. So what I want to turn to now is for you to get into your groups and I want, uh, you know, each group is focused on a different chapter. There are six chapters that make up the argument that Lowell is setting out most fully in his last book here. And for each of the chapters, we need to figure out what are the key arguments that Lowell is making in chapter one, for example. What prior work and new observations is he using to make those arguments? What assumptions is he drawing on to make those arguments? And how is he putting those observations and or prior understanding assumptions, how is he putting that all together to develop, to actually, to, to actually f structure the argument that he's making? You know, what's the logic behind the arguments he's making? What are the fallacies that might be leading to weaknesses in, in it? So let's take... Let's take about 20 minutes for you to discuss in your groups uh, and come up with a description for each of the chapters. What are the key arguments that he's making in that chapter? And then we can analyze how that all fits together into this larger argument that he's trying to make.